Can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me? Okay. What's that? No. <laughs> gotcha. How's everyone doing? Good evening. Good evening. Okay, we're setting up. Let's get started here. All right. Okay, we better get started, I guess. All right. <laughs> Thanks for coming, everyone. First of all, um, may God bless you. I hope you left your uh, Christmas day was great. Whatever you did, whether it was with family, with yourselves, or whatever, hopefully it was great. No, we're in a trying time, but uh, just hope everything was great for you. And uh, today we're going to continue. Um, I'm going to talk about the characteristic of the word being active. Um, usually, if you're alive, which we finished up last week, really. Most of live people are active. Maybe we're active all in our different ways, but most of us are we're, we're active in some fashion, shape, or form. So we're going to tackle that uh, characteristic of the word being active. Right, uh, start off by giving you a, uh, a definition of, uh, from uh, the dictionary. Um, it says active is engaging or ready to engage in physically energetic pursuits. Uh, another one it gives us is pursuing an occupation or, or activity at a particular place or in a particular way. I think that pertains to the gospel because we're always pursuing something with this occupation. We're always trying to further the gospel. You know, we're always trying to better the people. Well, we're always trying to enlighten the people or, or teach them some things, show them some things or whatever. So, active. Um, let's start with... Uh, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, which we're all familiar with. I just want to read it just to give a point of references. And uh, I'm going to read it from the uh, Amplified Version here. But I'm just going to read the, I call it the A part. That's what I have. Yeah, 12, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. Just say amen when you get there. Hmm. All right. I read from the Amplified. And it says, For the word of God is living and active and full of power. It says, Making it operative, energizing, and effective. It is sharper than any two edged sword, penetrating as far as the division of the soul and spirit and the completeness of a person. And both joints and marrow, the deepest parts of her nature, exposing and judging the very thoughts and intentions of the heart. And that's more so just a point of reference. It's just that's what we're coming up with the characteristics uh, active. All right. Now, for those of you that still have your Bibles open, turn with me to Luke chapter 2, verse 46 through 49. Luke chapter 2, verse 46 through 49. Amen. Now, where do I want to start here? I'll pick up my reading and I'll read it and then I'll go back and we'll kind of analyze it if that's okay. Luke chapter 2, starting at verse 46. It said, And it came to pass that after three days they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of doctors, both hearing them and asking them questions. And all that heard him were astonished at his understanding and answers. And when they saw him, they were amazed. And his mother said unto him, Son, why hast thou thus dealt with us? Behold, thy father and I have sought thee sorrow. And he said unto them, How is it that ye sought me? Wist ye not that I must be about my father's business? Now, let I go here. You know that you're talking about those were people of the law, the doctors and lawyers of the law. I mean, uh, highly, I guess you would say, uh, educationally trained in the law. They sit on Moses' seat. And they were astounded at his answers that he was giving. And I imagine he may have been uh, enlightening them too as he was giving those answers. And 
asking certain questions that they didn't think that a 12-year-old kid should be doing. Now, why did I go to this verse? If you think about it, when we have our kids, they have a lot of energy, would you say? Mm. And we always use the saying, we must give that kid something to do. Why? To channel his or her energy in the right direction. Sometimes kids are put in sports. Sometimes they're put in dance or uh, the piano playing or some kind of instrument, whatever. But we want to channel their energy in an active way. Why? Because they're active. Well, Jesus, his father wanted to channel his energy in the right way. He was active. As a 12-year-old boy, you see him sitting in the midst of these doctors of the law, these teachers. But he was sitting there. He was active at 12 years old. What was his assignment? His assignment wasn't to play sports. Oh, you're following me. But his assignment was to be in the temple. You understand? He was active. He said, I'm a being about my father's business. Why? I always ask you, is Jesus the word that became flesh? Yes, that's what the Bible tell, tells us, right? So, no, it doesn't matter whether it's in material or material form. The word is active. All right? But he was active. He was actively doing something. He was actively being about his father's business. But my question to you, are you actively being about your father's business? But he was active. Can you see that? 12-year-old little boy, active. He says, yeah, I'll give him something to do. I'm going to send him down to earth. Are you with me? But he was active in doing something for his father. Not just for his father, but for you and you and you and you and me too. But he was active. Now, of course, Jesus, one of his offices was a priest, right? A priest, king, and a prophet. All right? But he wasn't acknowledged as a priest as a 12-year-old boy. Maybe not on earth, but in heaven he already was. But like I said, that was one of his offices. But notice, he was on the outside of the temple. He wasn't in the inner sanctuary, right? Because priests, that was reserved for priests to go in there and do what they did, right? So he was sitting on the outside. But I want to tell you, it doesn't matter whether you're on the inside or outside of the temple, of the church, of the synagogue, or wherever. As long as the word in you and you can give the word from your temple, it doesn't matter where you are. You don't have to be on the inside of the church. You don't have to be on the outside, I mean, inside of the building. But the, the word that is in you, that is in your temple. And that's what you're responsible for. And you can give that word out anywhere, at a grocery store, at a car wash, wherever you are. So it doesn't matter where you are. But the word inside of you, in that temple, you can give it out anywhere. Or you're still there. All right. I'm trying to get it warmed up here. Bear with me. But can you see that he was active? All right. Now, think about it here. Once the word is given, once the word is spoken, whatever man of God or woman of God that you sit up under or whatever, once the word is spoken, that word is active. It never falls asleep. It is still trying to get you to understand it when you leave this place. It is always working, working with the Holy Spirit to get you to understand what has been said or understand itself as the word. It always, it never lies dormant. It is always active. You can never accuse the word of falling asleep. Just like we in, uh, in school, maybe you've never <laughs> fallen fall asleep before. Or maybe even in church, <laughs> that you've never fallen asleep before. But you can never consider the word, or accuse the word of falling asleep because it's always active. It's always trying to make somebody life better. It's always trying to enlighten someone somewhere. But it's active. Question, did Jesus not do the same thing when he had his three-year tenure here on earth? He was active. He was always trying to make the next person better than they were before. Or you're still there. Now, so if that word is active, right? It's always active. My question is, is it active in you? Is it active in you? If that word that never that God speaks or that a person speaks is never dormant, should it be dormant in you? It should not be dormant in you either. It always should be alive and active, changing the situation, whether it's in your life or whether it's in the lives of others. Or you're still there. All right. Let me go on here. Now, I want to go back to something that I said here earlier. Hmm. Now, notice here. He told Mary, he said, you knew where I would be. He said, you don't have to question I would be. Let me, let me back up first. 
If you had a kid, did you have them in uh, some softball, if it was a girl, baseball, if it was a boy, tennis, whatever the case may be, football, you know that they have to have practice. They have practice from a certain time period. And you're, you're probably familiar with this, right? So you don't have to question where your kid is. Why? Because you know that they're doing exactly what they're supposed to be doing. This was Jesus. Can I give you another scenario? If you had a job, right, and you were supposed to be there at a certain ship, and you were a great employee, that boss, whether he's at home sleeping or she's at home sleeping, they don't have to question where you are because they know where your whereabouts are. You're at the job. Why? Because you're a great employee. That's just what Jesus would. He said, Mama, Mama, a mother, you didn't have to question where I is. You, you should have known where I was. You should have been worried. Why? Because I was actively in the temple fulfilling my assignment, what my Father has given me. In other words, I am active. I'm active. Are you still there? I'm trying to work it here for you. But he was active. So you shouldn't have to question his whereabouts. Because he was in the temple. Once again, being about his father's business. Oh boy. Let me go on here. Now, let's turn to John chapter 9, verses 4 through 5. But you get that, right? His father gave them something to do. A 12 year old didn't want to channel his energy in the right way, just like we, as we do children today. Except his was spiritual. Nothing's higher than that car. Nothing's higher than the one that Jesus had. John chapter 9, verses 4 through 5. Amen. He says, I must work the works of, them, of, of him that sent me while it is day. He said, the night cometh when no man can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Because he represented light. He said, I had a three-year mandate from heaven that I must work the work that has sent me. I have three years to do this. I must accomplish my mission. He says, it's not time for, why? Because he says, it's not time for a man to work at night. Why? Because we mostly work during the day. Yes, we have shift work and things of that nature here today, but he says we must, we must work during the day. That's what we're used to, accustomed to. And he says, why I'm in the world, it is light, because he was the true light. He was the light that came on a scene where you can actually see God. Not just with your eyes, but from your spirit. He was the same God said, let light be, be light, or light be, there be, or whatever he wanted to say. And it became, or it was, but that light. But he says, I must work the works of them who sent me while it is day. Why? Because night represented a time where he would be gone from the earth. But day represented a time where he would be here in the earth doing his father's work or about his father's business because he was active. Oh, boy. Now, as I was saying, he was aware they had a three-year tenure here on earth. If you know that you have an assignment sent somewhere abroad or whatever for three months, wouldn't you not try to fulfill that assignment in those three months? What if your, job, but your boss told you, if you're not finished in three months, then you cannot come back until this job is complete. That means that you have a three-month mandate. Well, he had a three-month spiritual mandate from his father. In fact, that's why he came. And that's why he said, I came down from heaven. I came down from heaven. He was even active in that, and we'll get to that in a minute. But he was always active. Active. Turn to us at Isaiah 55, uh, verse 11. Isaiah 55, verse 11. Just say amen when you get there. Can you still hear me? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm going to read from the Amplified Version here. Over there. Isaiah 55, verse 11? Mm -hmm. No, 
All right, reading from the Amplified here, it says, So will my word be which goes out of my mouth. It will not return to me void, useless, without result, without accomplishing what I desire, and without succeeding in the matter for which I sent it. It says, once I speak my word, it's active. It says, it cannot return to me void. It cannot return to me until it's at fulfilled its mission. Remember, I said if you were sent abroad for three months. And your boss told you, you have to fulfill this assignment. If you're not fulfilled in three months, you still have to stay there until it's fulfilled. That's a saying what Jesus had. He's the word that became flesh. God just said it through Isaiah. He says, it's this word that I speak out of my mouth. He says, it cannot come back to me void. Why? That's why Jesus had to accomplish every mission before he can actually go back to the Father and be at the right hand of the Father where he was rightfully belong, where he rightfully belonged. The same thing applies. He had to be active. So now we see why he had a three-year mandate that he had to fulfill. But just as that word cannot come back to us, boy, or to God, boy, Jesus could not come back to his father. Why? Why? Because he's the word that became flesh. And he had a three-year assignment that he had to complete. Now we see why he says, I must work the way, work the works of those who sent me while it is day. Can you see that? Oh, boy, let me go on here. Now, Let me read this. He was given a three-year mandate or an official order from heaven to carry out his mission. That's an explanation as to, as to when a decree is made by us, why the necessary time is required to be given to that decree, because we give the word a mandate. Can you see that? You give the word. When you declare a decree, I declare the decree, not tomorrow, or right now. You give the word a mandate. You give it an assignment, a mandate, right then and there. Jesus had that same mandate. You have that same mandate upon your life, but it's up to you to discover it. But he says, I, may, I must work the works of them who sent me while it is dead, because he was active. Are you understanding me? All right. Let me go on here. Now, let's turn to uh, Matthew, uh, I mean, uh, Mark chapter 10, verses 46 through 52. Mark chapter 10, verses 46 to 52. Just say amen when you get there. Amen. All right. Okay. Mark chapter 10, verse 46. And it reads, give me one second. All right. It says, and they came to Jericho as he went out of Jericho with his disciples and a great number of people. It says, blind Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, sat by the highway side, I mean, highway side begging. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. And many charged him that he should hold his peace. But he cried the more a great deal. Thou son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stood still and commanded him to be called. And they, and they called the blind man, saying unto him, Be of good comfort, rise, he calleth thee. And he, casting away his garment, rose and came to Jesus. And Jesus answered and said unto him, What wilt thou, I mean, what, what wilt thou that I should do unto thee? Now, he's crying out to him. He's crying out to him. He says, I want to help you. I want to help you. He says, I want to make your life better. Tell me what I must do. What am I trying to show you first? The word always thirsts and hungers for an assignment to be fulfilled. It's always searching. The word, I say again, it always thirsts and hungers for an assignment to be fulfilled. It's always searching. Even though Jesus knows what he needed, he says, tell me what you want. Why? Because the Bible says you must be specific. Tell me what I need. Tell me what I need to do. He says, I want to help you, but tell me. Give me permission to help you. Tell me what you need me to do for you. That's why I said the word is always active. It's always searching for an assignment to fulfill. 
if first it craves an assignment to be fulfilled. That's what we must understand. We go to God begging, oh, Father, would you just do this one little thing? He's always looking for an assignment to be fulfilled. And that's what we must understand as his children. He's always looking for an assignment to be fulfilled. But you have to give him an assignment. If you never give your child an assignment, hey, do this, how, how do they know what to do? Yeah, the word is intelligent. Yeah, and honestly, it does know what you what it wants you to do, what you, what you want it to do before you say it. But it needs your permission. It needs you to say it. But he's actively searching for assignment. He's hungry. He's hungry for assignment to be fulfilled. You're never inconvenienced in the word by asking the word or speaking the word. Because when you speak it, he knows, well, this is what I'm supposed to do. You're never putting the word at inconvenience. You're never putting God at inconvenience when you're asking for something. He's always looking and searching for an assignment that needs to be fulfilled. Think about it. Some people are truly dedicated to their job. And some people like challenges. Right? If it's too easy, oh, that's not, that, that's not really challenging me. But they like a challenge. The Word likes a challenge. There's nothing that you can put in front of the Word that it cannot accomplish. Nothing. What did Jesus tell uh, Sarah? He says, anything too hard for God? <laughs> he says, you'll be pregnant. Matter, matter or less, if you laugh inside, laughter or whatever. He says, matter or less, you'll be pregnant. Is there anything too hard for me? <laughs> you're not putting a burden on him by asking the word when you speak the word. You're not putting a burden on the word. Or when you ask God for something, you're not putting a burden on God. All right? Because he wants to fulfill. Oh, boy. Are you still there? Good boy. In other words, he's saying, please, give me an assignment, please. That's what Jesus was telling the guy. Give me a assignment. What do you want me to do? Give me an assignment. I thirst for it. I hunger for it. In fact, that's why one of the reasons that I came into the world were to fulfill it. I'm not talking about all my other fulfill, fulfillments, but I came into the world for, for, to fulfill it for you. What do you need? What do you need? What do you need, Brother Keith? I came to fulfill it. What do you need? What do you need? Oh, dear, I'm getting excited about myself. <laughs> Let me pick up my reading here. <laughs> okay, I'll pick up my reading. It says, And Jesus answered and said to him, What will that, that I should do unto thee? The blind man said unto him, Lord, that I might receive my sight. And Jesus said unto him, Go thy way. Thy faith has, I mean, have made thee whole. And immediately he received this sight and followed Jesus in the way. That's all Jesus wants. He's not doing it because he's Jesus. But he's doing it because he had compassion, because he wants to fulfill the assignment that you give him. It's deeper than that. I say again, don't go to God with a beggary mentality. Oh, Father. <laughs> and then you get in your little holy voice. Oh, I know I messed up last night. But, um, I just need this one little favor. <laughs> this one little thing. No. Be yourself with God. That's what you must understand. That's your Father. Your Father's going to see you mess up plentiful. Do you understand? But He still loves you. He still wants to do for you. He still wants to fulfill the assignment. He still wants you to fulfill your assignment that your life is based on. Oh, you're still there. All right, man. I just thought I'd throw it in that for Okay. But can you see that? It thirsts for that. It hungers for that. It has an appetite for a word to be, for an assignment to be fulfilled. Yeah. Yeah. That's what it does. Oh, boy. So... Next time when you pray to God and you're asking for something, say, Lord, I'm just giving you a assignment, an assignment to fulfill because I know you want to fulfill it. So you have to be bold. You have to understand the nature of the relationship that you have with him. You're no longer on the outside <laughs> like the Gentiles were. You understand? The blessing is upon you. You're a seed of who? All right. 
Yeah. Oh boy. I better go on here. Got another hour. Stay with me. <laughs> another hour. Just getting warmed up. But let's talk about actively working without interruption. Actively working without interruption. John chapter 14, verses 2 through 3. Check the time now, because the faster you get there, the more information we're going to cover. <laughs> I'm younger. Excuse me, just say amen when you get there. Amen. John chapter 14, verses 2 through 3. Amen. All right, I like the way you said that, brother. He said it strong. Amen. <laughs> now, it means something to you. All right. Are we all there? Amen. amen. I got plenty of time. Take your time. We got another hour now. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. I just thought I'd throw a little humor. Okay. John chapter 14, starting at verse 2. It says, In my father's house are many mansions. <laughs> he's not talking about rooms. Mm -hmm. Come on. But he's talking about dwelling places. Mm -hmm. And I think I used this before, but think about it. What if Brother Ken next week? built a 50,000 square foot castle. <laughs> Go boy. <laughs> oh, shit. Could he not fit each of us that's in the room today and we have our own room, our own restroom every day? Could he not fit us all in there? That's the same with your father's house. I told you before, the square footage is unlimited. Killer views and everything. Do you understand? It says streets are made of gold, but it's unlimited. Unlimited. It's not, hey, you know, when someone dies, oh, let me go add on another room. For the carpenter, come on, Jesus, you are a carpenter here, right? <laughs> I'm not adding on another room. But he says it's unlimited. The square footage is unlimited. Does that make sense? Yeah, some people think that. Oh, yeah, no, no he's not talking about uh, rooms, but it's dwelling places. It's a dwelling place for you. In my father's house. And that's personal. In, in, in other words, he said, in my father's house, this is where I'm supposed to dwell. Why? Because this is my father's house. In other words, when I die and go to heaven, I am supposed to be here. Why? Because it is my father's house. Oh, dear. All right. I just thought I'd throw it in for free. Now, he says, if it were not so, I would have told you. He says, I go to prepare a place for you. He says, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and I will see you unto myself, that where I am, there, may, there ye may be also. I used this before, right? Jesus is VIP. Now, I don't know if some of you remember this, but I said, if you had a friend or you know a certain celebrity, right? Now, they're a celebrity. They get all the preferential treatment, hopping out of limos and this and that, red carpet walking and, and just all this good treatment, right, in VIP. Now, maybe you are nobody. Well, you're actually somebody. I'm just throwing a scenario. But because you came with that celebrity or you came with that friend, now you may enter into the VIP room also. Not based on you, but because based on what the celebrity did. And that's Jesus. And that's why he says, I must go to prepare a place for you. Now, everything was already prepared before the foundation of the world. I think it's that Hebrews, uh, maybe four. Let me look at that. I'm going to tell you, maybe not four. Four, is it six, four through six? Let me check that on there. But everything was already prepared. So he's not preparing anything now. He's not adding on new rooms. I told you before, how did he make preparation? How? Number one, right? His dissension. He came, right? He had to teach. He had to make disciples. He could not bypass the cross. Are you with me? From the cross, he could not bypass the tomb. Oh dear. From the tomb, he could not bypass hell. From hell, he could not bypass the resurrection. From the resurrection, he could not bypass the ascension. From there, he could not bypass his rightful place of seating at the right hand of the Father. Not the right hand side, 
But the right hand means your man of authority, not the right hand side. Just because a man is sitting at the right, right of me doesn't mean that he's a man of authority. It doesn't mean that's a man who I vested all authority in. But it means the person I vested that authority in, right hand of God. I told you before, you don't see God, you don't see the Father. He's a spirit. You don't see Jesus sitting next to the Father and the Holy Spirit flying over him like a dove. No, when Jesus comes back, you'll see the Father and the Holy Spirit. Who? In Jesus. But that was his preparation. He says, I go to prepare a place for you. He says, I cannot bring you into VIP if I don't go prepare a place. But he's preparing the whole time. That's why I said he's the only guy that I know that had work without interruption. Do you understand? He never took a break. Even on his dying day, even on the cross as he was dying, even as he was laid in a tomb, there was work without interruption. He was active. Oh, you're still there. Can you see that? He was active. He never took a break. And that was the preparation. All through that, he had to go through that. Heaven was created, what? It says, in the beginning, who? The heavens and what? Everything was created. But when he's talking about his preparation, he goes, make ready. Make ready the place. Why? The place was already there. But through his preparation, through his death, through his ascension, all those things, and that's how he went to prepare a place for you. And I say again, get it, get it, get it. It is work without interruption. He is active. The word is active. Think about it. If I'm sitting down here, seems like I'm resting, right? But if I'm still preaching or teaching to you, what am I doing? I'm active. So what am I saying? It doesn't matter that he was laying in a tomb resting as some would thought. Do you understand? It doesn't matter that he was on a cross and he gave up the ghost and some think he wasn't active. It doesn't matter whether I'm sitting down because I am still active. It doesn't matter that he was on a cross because he was still active. Active. If I have a business meeting and I'm sitting down and I'm talking to another business partner or someone that I'm trying to make a deal with, even if I'm sitting down on a, on, on, in a chair but I'm on the phone, I'm on a conference call, am I still being active? Yes, Why? Because I'm taking care of my father's business. Can you see it? Amen. He's active. Oh, boy, I don't want to leave this alone. I'm getting excited here. <clears throat> Are we together? Amen. Amen. Oh boy. Hmm. Would you think I was crazy if I told you Jesus had assistance with his active work? Sometimes we have partners. Sometimes they're partners in crime. Sometimes we have a co-workers. And we're all on a project together. But we're working towards what one common Go. Oh, you're still there. Mm -hmm. Turn with me to John chapter 2, verse 19. We still got another 45 minutes now. Say amen when you get there. Yeah. <clears throat> Jesus had assistance with his active work. <laughs> now, John two, chapter 2, verse 19 says, Jesus answered and said unto them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Now, we know that a temple had already been destroyed in the Old Testament, and, you know, and uh, when he made this statement, they thought he was crazy. This is how are you going to build a temple in three days? But well, we know he was talking about what? His body, the temple of the Holy Ghost. Now, think about it here. He had assistance. They had to destroy or kill him in death. They had to destroy that temple. So in order for him to what? Resurrect again. Oh, you're following me? So even though they assisted, even though... It, was, it had to be fulfilled. And even though they thought they were doing a good thing with their work for us, they still were actively participating in his work. 
or his death without even realizing it. He had assistance in his work. Just as you and a colleague, that colleague would assist you, you would assist a colleague, right? They actively assisted him in his active work by killing him. I told you before, he was the only baby that was born into this world that was born to die. To die. To die. If he wasn't, then why would a child that's of a young age die was so heartbroken? If they were meant to be born into the world to die, no, they were born to live a life. He came into this world. 33 years old, I believe, and what? He was, at 33, he had three years old, I think something like that, and he was dead. Why? Because he came to die. As I said earlier, that's part of his active work without interruption. And that's why he says, he says, uh, sacrifices and burnt offerings, you have no pleasure. He says, but a body you have who prepared for who? Elysium? He didn't say Elysium. He said, Sister Nancy? He didn't say Sister Nancy. He didn't say Sister Janice. He said, a body that you prepare for me. Why? Because he was supposed to offer that body on the altar, which is the cross, as a living sacrifice for you. But can you see it? They actively helped him with his active work. They didn't even realize it, but they were participating. They were colleagues of Jesus. They didn't even realize it with his work. Are you still there? Yeah. All right. Ooh, Lord Jesus, where should I go here? Does everything make sense? Mm -hmm. I know you're smart and all anyway, so it <laughs> doesn't matter. But really... You must really understand, though. I say again, he wants to fulfill assignment. He's craving assignment. What's your favorite food? What's your favorite food? Shirley. Um, Sister Shirley, yeah. I'm sorry, I should have said you. Okay. Ice cream? <laughs> Do you ever crave ice cream? Sometimes. Sometimes? What's your favorite food, Brother Ken? Fried chicken. Fried chicken, all right. So do we have a crave that fried chicken all the time? All the time. <laughs> Can you see where I'm going, though? It craves. The word craves, just like he craves fried chicken. Just like she craves ice cream. Just like she craves all <laughs> kinds of things. <laughs> but you see, that's the appetite of the word. It has an appetite. It has an appetite for assistance. It has an appetite to help you. It has an appetite to be there for you. It wants to be active. And I'm just reiterating, Jesus, 12 years old in the temple, actively working. In enlightening people were 12 years old. They were, I imagine, I could, I could look, look on their faces. I, I studied a lot. Oh, my God. My God. Listen to this kid. Listen to me. These people with so much wisdom. Where did he get it from? Where did he get it from? He's not in our classes, so where did he get it from? That's why I tell you, there's a difference between book knowledge and knowledge that the Holy Ghost gives you. Yeah. yeah. There's a big difference. Why? Because he can teach you things in five minutes or seconds that it takes someone else 20 years to learn. If you're listening. If you're listening, if you're listening, yeah. And I told him before, yeah, I plan to get this degree and that degree, but that's book knowledge. I've said and listened to a lot of professors, right? And they have a lot of book knowledge, but they don't know how to communicate it to the people. So what's the good of having book knowledge, but you don't know how to help the people communicate it to the people or put it on a lower level? Right? So they can understand and comprehend it. That's right. If I'm teaching you something, but you cannot, or you haven't learned to put it to work, sometimes it takes practice. Okay, I failed at that. Let me try it again. All right? You put it to work. But if I'm teaching you something and you're not learning how to put it to work, possibly, I mean, there's a possibility that it could be me. I'm not putting it at your level where you can understand and grasp it. Because the word is meant to be put to work. Oh, you're still there. Mm -hmm. All right. Let's switch subjects. Let's talk about the word characteristic of it being investigative. All right. 
is investigator. Do you know any private investigators? Yeah. Now, let me read Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12 once again. You don't have to go there. I'll just read it to you. Mm -hmm. I'm going to read it on the Amplified again. Now, if you want to go there, that's, that's fine. But I'm going to read Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. Amplified. So, for the word of God is living and active and full of power, making it operative, energizing, and effective. It is sharper than any two-edged sword, penetrating as far as the vision of the soul and spirit, the completeness of a person. And it says in both joints and, uh, joints and marrow. It says the deepest, part, the deepest parts of our nature. Exposing and judging the very thoughts and intentions of the heart. Now, as the Holy Spirit was teaching me, and I was messing with this some time ago. He gave to me, he said, the word separates a device through the gifting of discernment. Now, if you look at that, it talks about the soul and spirit. Even though we have evil words and whatnot, and they're used interchangeably for heart and soul and spirit, but the heart, I mean, the soul and the spirit are two different things. Yeah, they're both in immaterial parts. Always say, think about it. When he's breathed the breath of life in you, you became alive, what? A human being. When he breathed the breath in you to be born again, you became spiritually alive. That did not go into your soul, it went into your spirit. That's what makes you alive to God. So then when it talks about now man, it says dividing between the soul and the spirit. Man might not know where that is. Where is that division line? What is the divide? What is the divide? Man I might know, but the word of God knows the divide. If it was a surgeon and it had to cut, it knows exactly what it cut, where the thin line is between the soul and the spirit. How did he know that? Are you following me? How did Jesus know certain things when he was walking earth? Some things were revealed, some things are that, some things are word of knowledge. It depends on who you ask. But sometimes he, he knew why, because he used the gifting of the servant. Which many Christians don't have today. Well, let me take that back. It's not that they don't have it, but they're not operating in it. Think about it. Sometimes a person may pray for you. But if you're using the gifting of the discernment, you probably won't allow them, allow them to lay their hands on you. Just some things you know. I'm very particular. Very particular. Very particular. And I'll say it, I'll say it again. I will not let anyone pray. Another day's story, maybe another day's teaching. Why? It's my discernment. I've seen things where people laid hands on certain people. They weren't using the gift of the discernment. Some of them are crippled. So my question is, was it really praying for you? Or was it really praying for your demise or your downfall? There's certain things true. Certain things are true. Some people in uh, what is it? Uh, sheep, uh, sheep's clothing. How do you know? Use your gifting of what? The spirit. And to each is his own. Just the respond the information that I am responsible for knowing. I have them responsible for passing out to you. Now you do with you what you like it or not. You, you do what you want with it. But I have an obligation to give it out. Not calling any particular names, but you have to be very careful. Even in a church today, you have to be very careful. Very careful. And I'm not saying get scared and don't let this person pray for you, but I'm just saying you have to be using your gift of discernment. Right. Some might not like it, but truth is truth. Truth is truth. Oh, you're still there. Amen. Don't hang up on me yet. I got another hour here. All right. But does that make sense to you see with the soul and the spirit, right? Mm -hmm. So think about it. If someone had a tumor, let me put it this way, that was blended in with a certain organ in some kind of fashion or form, right? Doesn't that surgeon 
have to know where the line is between that tumor and the organ. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So in other words, the surgeon has to do an investigation, an investigation process that we'll get to. But I say again, what is he talking to? What is he talking about? Using the gifting of the word through the servant. It's investigating. When you're discerning, you're investigating. What about when people say, pray for me, but they don't give you, they don't tell you why, and it's like, okay, so do I pray for me? What are you praying for? Well, sometimes, can I be honest? Sometimes people just say it because it's a way of talking. It sounds so morally right. It sounds cool. Pray for me. Yeah. Sometimes you'll say, okay, well, I pray for Oh, just pray for me. So you know they really didn't mean it. Sometimes when a person, and it just depends on how you led. Sometimes a person may not want to reveal to you what's praying. Well, you can pray You can pray in tongues if you want to. That may, it may scare some people. Or sometimes you can say, hey, Father, you know exactly what they need. From the crown of their whole to the cell of feet. I mean, whatever you led to pray. All the time, you won't know. Sometimes, while you're praying, the Holy Spirit will reveal it to you. And you'll know exactly what to say. But never miss... How can I say it? Never be surprised at the wording that you use when you pray. When sometimes you don't know what to pray for. Because you'll, in your mind, you'll be like, well, I don't know why I said that, but the Holy Ghost knows. Right. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Or am I going no, in the wrong no, situation? No, it makes sense. Just for a long time, I guess, I thought mm -hmm. you had to be very specific in... Well, when you request, like, okay, God, I'm looking for that white whatever, this and that, this and that, this model, so and so, be specific. But here and there, that, that, that case there, you're praying for them. To me, there's, there's a difference. Okay. Okay. You may not necessarily know. And you pray. Okay. Like I said, it could be, oh, Father, touch them right now. And honestly, that could be all that they may need. And then you can go deeper. But it's just it's just different ways you have to learn uh, you have to learn how to do it. Go ahead. On a smaller scale, I have, <clears throat> when I was going to this Christian school, I have yes, people sir. come to me and say, uh, Mr. Canyon, would you pray that I make an A on my final exam? <laughs> I said, no, yeah. I won't. But I will pray that God will help you recall everything you studied. Yeah. 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 Very true. I'm sorry. Now, that's very true. That's true. And I'm not to make an A on my That's very true. <laughs> you know, a lot of times, and this may sound crazy, <laughs> and I'm glad you brought that up. I'm glad you brought the question up, too. We're always taught to pray. Right. And I think I said some in reference maybe last week. We always talk to pray, 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 pray. And I believe in prayer, but I tell you, sometimes God doesn't want you to pray. He wants you to do something. Yeah. And I always use the example of Moses. He says, don't cry out to me now. He says, you take the rod. He says, you stretch it out. And he says, you divide it. So all the time, God doesn't want any prayer. And I always tell people, God wants you to do something sometimes. Sometimes we must get away from prayer and we must get into the realm of decree. Do you understand? How mm -hmm. decree in the name of Jesus that this is so... You, you, you have to move, change the realms. The Holy Spirit will let you know. But we're always saying pray. We're always saying, well, pray with them. Sometimes a person is not ready to be prayed with. They're not ready to be prayed with. Some things you can sense it. I remember praying with a lady some years ago. Me and my mother was praying with her. We were asked to pray with her. I felt the rejection. As soon as I touched her, I knew nothing wasn't going to happen. I knew. It's just annoying. But we always say some people are not ready to be prayed for. A lot of times we use prayer as an excuse. Sometimes we already know what God has told us to do, but we say, oh, let me pray about it. You already know what he told you to do, but you're using it as an excuse. But sometimes people, as, as crazy as they seem, sometimes they're not ready to be prayed for. I think I said last week, as soon as... As soon as uh, you pray for them, they're going to go out to church and notify everything you said. Why? Because they're going to keep on talking the same type of talk that they've been talking for years. So why pray with you? Why pray with you? Can I go a little further? Sometimes you don't need anybody to pray for you. Pray for yourself. Amen. Well, you're not a temple of the Holy Ghost? Question, what's inside of you? Is the word inside of you? 
Is power inside of you? Is might inside of you? Right? Do those miracle, miracle working power and abilities within you? Right? Exousia, authority, isn't that, that not in you? It's in you. It's already been conferred to your account. It's already in you. You don't have to pray just to get the power. Why? Because the power's already been vested in you. You only pray how until you can line up and understand what God is telling you to do. It's just like if you had a healing meeting. The power is already in you. But you should pray a long time before going to that healing meeting to lay hands on the pool. Why? Because you need the Spirit of God to direct you. He may tell you to pray for this person this way and pray for that person that way. They may have the same condition, but he may tell you to do it a different way. Why? Because that's the way he told you to do it. Don't question it. Just do it. But there's so many things we can get to on prayer. But it's very vital. And I think I said before, I can pray for you, but I cannot do your praying for you. <clears throat> I say again. Go ahead. Yes, ma'am. There's times you can pray for people, but if their receiver is broken, I hear you. it does no good. I hear you. I totally agree. And you know, you think about that. It's just like, okay, so you had a healing conference, right? And this this man or this woman, whoever the case, they've been healing people all over the world. Right? Say so you go up there. Right? And you're up there, oh, no, I ain't doing anything to me. What did I tell you? The problem is a Christian's ability to receive. Mm -hmm. You're so right. Yeah. Yeah. Receive. Your faith. Yeah. Uh -huh. Right? Why did Jesus say sometimes, well, be it done unto you, according to your faith? Can I be honest with you? Many times, God would do it that one time on my faith. I lay hands on you. Are you willing? Are, are you with me? But sooner or later, God expects you to grow up. Are oh, you still riding training wheels on a bicycle? No, why? Because you grew up. Are you what? Matured. He wants you to spiritually mature. See, once somebody prays for you, you should be thinking in your mind next time, oh, now it's time for me to pray for others. Are oh, you with me? What am I saying? You must graduate and grow. Don't stay stuck at the same level. Why? Because when you stay stuck at the same level, it does no one else any good. But God expects you to grow. He expects you to grow. He expects you to grow. Why do you think Jesus, because everybody say, oh, well, Jesus did that, or oh, I can't do that, but doesn't he have the same power as you? Didn't he come here as a mere man and he relied on the Holy who? Spirit. That's what people don't understand. Yes, he was 100% God and 100% man, but he relied on the Holy Spirit. And that's what you must understand. That power that was working in him, he said, my father doeth the work in me. Do you understand that? He says, my father doeth the work in me. In other words, you can say that Holy, the Holy Spirit was his father, or you can say God the Father was his father. Why? Because the Holy Spirit is just an extension of God. It said that it is a spirit that proceeded from the Father. John 15 and 26 is I believe. It proceeded from the Father. Yeah. Oh boy, I'm glad we got on it, all right? Yeah. You know, and a lot of people say, I'm, I'm going to close this off, but that, well, this is not a prosperity gospel. You're right. But you're wrong. Why do I say that? Because once you get the word in you, once you understand how to work the word, you can bring prosperity. Amen. Say that again, Brother Ken. God wants you to be prosperous. Amen. Say that one more time. No, I don't think they heard it. Okay. But see, that's what a lot of Christians think if I'm struggling. Oh, I'm, I'm being humble. I'm struggling. No, no. How are you going to give to a cause? How are you going to show it to someone's ministry? How are you going to give offering? How are you going to get alms on the street? How? 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 No, he doesn't want you to be, just like he doesn't want you to be sick. And I say to you, if he doesn't want you to be sick, he must not want you to be poor. Come on. Yeah. Come on. <laughs> if you can accept the fact, even with healing, if you can accept the fact 
that he spiritually heal you from your sins? Why wouldn't he heal you from your illness? Amen. All right, I better leave it alone. May we bow real quick. Our Father, we thank you. We thank you even for the questions that were asked, Lord. We thank you, Lord. We thank you because you know where we should go even when we don't know where we should go. Lord, I thank you, Lord Jesus, even as we come to New Year's, Lord, I thank you that everybody is protected, everybody is safe. Lord Jesus, I ask you to allow them to enjoy a time with family in this, in this difficulty right now. I ask you to touch them. Lord Jesus, as I point my head, they will prosper in every area of their life. Lord Jesus, whatever season that's been barren in their life, it comes to life right now and gives birth. Lord, I declare and decree it. It is so. In your son's name. Amen. 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 All right. Thank you for coming.